Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. So this video here is going to be a little bit different to my normal gardening related videos. This is actually going to be about my parents house here and they've basically got a house which is pretty much self-sufficient in vegetables and, and fruit from the garden and also self-sufficient in energy for powering the house and heating the house. So I'm going to talk about the two aspects. So the video is going to be in uh, two parts. I'll probably just have it as one video though. So if it isn't one video, I'll put a timestamp in now. For anyone who doesn't want to see the gardening side, they can skip ahead to the Tesla power wall, the solar panels and the and a log burning stove, how the house is heated and powered. But for now, I'm going to go into the garden, talk about the plant aspect first, how they might feed themselves with vegetables and, and various other plants. So the garden basically consists of just a back garden, there's not really a front garden, um, just a thin strip of gravel. As you can see when I was standing earlier, it was next to the wall, or the, next to the road, Is uh, the house is right up against the road. So this is the back garden, it's kind of separated into two sections, so this section on the left is what I'm going to be talking about, that's the vegetable plot. This higher section is basically there's a terrace here, of probably about one meter in height. This is the back, um, and this is... This is basically just a, a lawn area for drying clothes and things like that. There's not actually any production of food here. This section at the back, this bit on the right hand side, isn't really a food production area. This is also ornamental, so you've got ornamental beds. And I need some repairs doing to the, the fence as you can see. On all this section here on the left is a food production area. But I'll start over here. There is a, a small section here which is food production. So we've got fruit trees, as I say my parents are quite self-sufficient in fruit, um, not completely yet in apples, uh, but they're self-sufficient in, in strawberries and raspberries. So here are some recently planted fruit trees, these have not been in for too long. We've got an existing dams in here, which has been in for several years. Um, it's never bore fruit though, so that's not really done much for them yet. But the new, new trees are, have got dwarfing root stocks, they fruit much faster. We've also got some some currant bushes here. There's actually uh, about four currant bushes, that's one of them there. We've also got, uh, I believe this is a, a plum tree. This one's quite a size, it's already giving a little bit of fruit. Uh, this is an apple tree. All these were only planted last year, so they only had one or two apples on them, but this will be doing much better of the years to come. We've got a second apple tree here as well. And then we've also got a cherry tree there. You can see it's just starting to grow. And then there's an older apple back there, but that's an extreme dwarfing rootstock. Uh, so it's not, it does have a heavy crop for the size of it, but it doesn't produce a whole lot because it's a very small plant and it's never going to get much bigger than that. It's only going to grow about two meters at most. So the new ones have a more vigorous rootstock and they're on a, what they call like a semi-vigorous rootstock. So these other apple trees, so as this one here, this should grow to about three or four meters in size and it shouldn't get any larger and should be producing heavy crops once it does get to that size. So coming round, we've also got some other currant bushes here. My parents have got a mixture of, I think, red and, and white and red and black currants. Um, they tend to do okay. They don't do too well in this garden. I think it's probably a little bit cold up here in the north Scotland. As I say, this is a, roughly around 58 degrees north, so it's quite far north. The climate can be a bit challenging. So over here, I'll take you to the main production area. So starting on the left here, this is an entirely this entire strip is um, raspberries. So you can see there, you've got several meters of raspberries. So these are autumn fruiting raspberries, and these produce uh, fruit uh, twice a year. So often with, uh, with autumn fruiting raspberries, what you're told to do is cut them down completely in autumn, and then they'll won't fruit again until next autumn. But we found if we keep them unpruned, just take out all the old dead ones from the previous year, they will actually fruit twice. So you can see these have already fruited once, and this was during the autumn. There was actually some fruit left on here just the other day. I think I can find one here. And this is currently the end of January, so you can see that they're, it's surprising how long the fruit actually lasts on them plants. So these all fruit, as I say, in autumn, probably kind of September, or maybe at the end of August, all the way through to December, they'll be fruiting until the hard frost come basically. And then in springtime, these all put on side branches. You won't see any stems for side branches now because they would have been all previous year's growths. So they've been removed, but they put out lots of side branches and then they also get fruit kind of June until August time. So they get a really long window with fruiting with this, but because if you leave the stems on the autumn fruiting ones like this, they don't, fruit quite as heavy in the autumn 
and they also don't fruit quite as heavy in the su in the summer but it means you don't have a bumper crop and have too much you have a really long even growing season so you can get a nice load of um, raspberries throughout most of the year as you can see they do go up to about 10 meters so it's quite a distance to them so i can't here anyway as i need to make sure i'm facing away from the sun you can see there's lots of raspberries up this whole section and something else we've done in this section which isn't related to to the garden is in, in the in the um, food production aspect but it is in the power production for the heat in the house we do have some hybrid willows here so these have just been coppiced for the first time they're only about two or three years old so you can see how thick they've already grown and these were approximately three or four meters in height you can see over there we've got a real bundle of all the ones that have been cut down so there's already quite a lot of mass from that but because these are hybrid willows they grow incredibly fast now they've been cut they should grow two or three meters again in height next summer and that will produce a lot of wood willow is not the greatest wood for burning but it's really good for kindling and it's also good for chipping materials so they can use the chipping materials once it's been chipped up use it for the paths in the garden also for weed suppression so you can see here we've got a lot of wi uh, wooden material that's been chipped some of it is probably the willow that keeps some of the weeds down it's also on the pa pa uh, path areas as well you can see this path is um it's got old leylandi clippings to keep the, the uh, weeds away and protect the soil so that's what they'll be used for so this is the main vegetable plot um it's in four rough sections but each section is occasionally subdivided into other strips and uh, the strips are normally done so they can be walked down but um most of the strips we don't have paths down the middle it's normally just paths around the edge where the grass is and possibly one down the middle of the plot we don't normally have too many more unless it's a plant like a runner bean or something that needs harvesting almost every two or three days so my parents normally have a rotation to keep it going around make sure there's no blood off a disease or anything so this for example is the garlic and onion plot at the moment it was the potato i believe last year you can see the potatoes are still there they're still harvesting them um, and they just keep quite well under, under the soil as long as the frost doesn't get too hard and you can see this year's crop is just starting to come up it's january now and it's currently frosty um so there's not a whole lot of growth but you can see some shoots starting to come up and you can see the soil is actually completely frozen at the moment it is quite a hard frosty time at the moment so i'll talk about a bit like about the general the garden in general so i'll show you some photos now um it was completely bare there was nothing here at all there was a a row of young leylandi planted at the back those two camellias there and there were also in place but pretty much it was just a big field it just just grass almost like a football field so we've been trying to plant up as much as possible also get windbreaks another reason for the willow is to provide a windbreak also the trees the fruit trees over there will provide a windbreak as well we've got a few trees planted at the back but we don't want to put too many trees in because otherwise our neighbors won't get any sun during the winter months we've also got over here there's a really windy corner so we've let the leylandi grow quite tall so you can here see here this is the leylandi hedge it's probably about three meters in height and it's just covering this corner because we get really strong winds um we've got houses you can see just to the north of us but past those houses is a, is a big cliff and then the sea and in really rough storms we do have to get foam blowing up from the sea we can get salt spray damage in the garden so the main thing is to mitigate the the effects of the strong winds so over here is the compost heap and in there we've got a tree planted we've also got a rowan tree some old christmas trees planted here and some other shrubs that will be growing up such as the escalonia here we've got a silver birch got quite a tall sitka spruce there and basically we're just trying to create a windbreak because this is the westerly direction the wind normally comes from the west so we're trying to fill it up as much as we can with plants and, and trees to mitigate the wind but we all have to be careful that it doesn't start to shade the, the greenhouse and the polytunnel so we'll probably only grow them to about three or four meters in height otherwise we start trading off um, shelter from the wind with with sunlight so this is the a small patch of leylandi heads and the further up here doesn't look like much now because they're only planted recently we've got a, a row of evergreen holm oak there you can just see them there quite young and they're going to provide some more shelter 
and we, we did find there was quite a wind coming down from between these houses so what we've got here is another rowan and we've got a broom which is really well suited to strong winds and then we've also planted some more of the holm oaks down here these holm oaks should grow up in the next few years and they'll provide more shelter from the winds that come over from that direction and we've also in that direction planted this larch here which should also stop the wind and that's actually where the wind's coming from today so southwesterly that's the worst direction so that's why there's so many different layers of wind protection we're putting up there but the biggest protection we probably had from the wind is probably putting in the polytunnel this whole left hand side now these two plots between the polytunnel and the greenhouse are well protected and we've also got this in the middle of the garden to stop any winds kind of coming in from the up and over the window fences so we've got a uh, a eucalyptus tree here this is actually only four i think four years old so it's grown really fast um, but every year the top gets clipped off by the salt winds and it actually loses a lot of its leaves if i can find a photo i'll put one in now show you how many leaves it does lose in winter when the when the salt really starts to burn it So my parents are quite lucky here the soil is actually really rich you can probably see it's quite a dark color it is is, is very sandy soil so it's very easy and loose to work i can't show you today unfortunately because it is actually it's frozen solid um but it is a very loose soil very sandy so it's nice to work and it is naturally quite a rich soil it's very dark in color this this garden is actually 200 years old and you can see um well at least the house is 200 years old and this would have been used for food production for the people in the house you can see the garden is fully walled there's walls all around it to try and provide a bit of shelter because when this was first built there was probably nothing else around but bare fields so what they've been doing is 200 years of, of farming in this in this garden and gardening so the soil has become really good probably the last 20 or 30 years it was just grass so the soil was neglected for quite a while but luckily it kept a lot of the fertility that had been put into it for those 200 years so the soil didn't need too much work doing to it but we do add a lot of organic matter every year to improve the soil so my, my, my father uses a lot of seaweed it's really good for trace minerals also keeps the weeds down and adds organic matter to the soil and they use various types of mulches basically whatever mulches they can find so around the side here you can see they've used some grass here grass is normally used as a last resort mulch we tend to just mulch the clippings of the grass back into the lawn to feed the lawn we don't normally use it for covering the plots but we normally use other things like hedge clippings so you can see there that's uh i think that i believe that's privet hedge clippings from a neighbor so they use that to protect the soil and generally the main crops they grow they grow probably about three or four hundred onions That, that does almost do them for the year. They are pretty much self, they're 100% self-sufficient over the summer, almost 100% over autumn, and winter is quite good and so is spring, but um, there's obviously a bit of, uh, there's not much you can grow in winter, so it's, it's basically stored plants. So it's like the onions you can store, potatoes, which is this plot here. I'm not sure what they grew here last year, but um, they do grow a lot of beans and uh, broad beans and runner beans. This was probably the lettuce or salad crop section. There's, they grow a lot of salads over the summer. This area, I think, was the onions last year and also some of the beans. We've got some old um, spinach here. These have all gone to seeds, so they're pretty much finished. But you can see they had a row of spinach there. We've also got a row of leeks this is the brassica section so they had like brussels sprouts uh, curly kale cabbages they all grow a huge amount of that but these have all kind of died off now so there's not much here to sow but i'll put up some pictures now so you can see what the garden looks like in its prime in the summertime fortunately now it's, it's the end of january so everything's kind of died back most of the plots are empty so there's not much to sow So being so far north, the climate really is quite hard to grow a lot of plants. So you really can benefit a lot from having a polyton and having a lot more warmth for your plants and also a lot more shelter from the wind. So this is normally absolutely covered. You can't, in, in the summertime, you can't see to the end. And I'll show you some photos now of how full it is with plants. It's mainly tomatoes and other tropical plants.
So as you can see from that, it does have loads of plants in the summertime. And the soil in here, it needs a lot more nutrients added to it. If I go along here, you can see it's quite dusty and dry looking. What happens because it's so warm in here, the organic matter in the soil breaks down a lot faster and they had to add a lot more compost to here every year. So there hasn't been any compost put in yet, but um, they're going to be putting that in the next few weeks, start all the seedlings off for next year. So it's mainly tomatoes that are grown here, also a lot of butternut squash, uh, sweet corn as well, but it's quite humid in here and what tends to happen is the, the it's too humid for the pollen, so it doesn't pollinate very well on the sweet corn. So they're having to uh, probably do a bit less of sweet corn. And they also grow peppers as well. Anything tropical really, they grow in here. Tomato is probably one of the biggest crops, followed by the butternut squash. The butternut squash is great because it can be kept in store for so long. I built this last year. Um, I'll show you some clips of that now. Uh, it's basically an area where you put plants that need some warmth. The sun can pit holds the temperature. You put over some covers the, to heat, keep the heat in and you can start the plants a lot earlier maybe February March time inside there and it's probably about five or ten degrees warmer than it is outside so you can start your tropicals early because if, if you put tropicals out here although the polytunnel does keep the heat okay it does tend to get cold if there's a hard frost it will kill anything tropical over the winter time. So this middle area I've got my sunken pit and there's also a little parsley plant which is just coming back from from winter so I've, I've I've done a video on this as well, I'll put that in the description of how I made it and things. Um, but it's done really well, it's kept the temperature up overnight which is exactly what I was hoping for. So these are all the tomato plants in here, you can still see they're still very young but they're, um, they're starting to get there. Looks like I might need to water one or two of them as it's been quite warm. You've got sweet corn down there, hasn't had 100% germination, I think the seeds may be a little bit old but we'll have to see what to do about them. I've also got quite a lot of sweet peppers down here as well and they're looking quite good at the moment. So over at this end we have a small pond, it's looking very green at the moment, it probably needs a water change, it's been um, it's, over the winter months it tends to not to not do a huge amount so they don't give it too many water changes and they're not going around regularly watering the polytunnel. But this is for frogs, we do have frogs in the polytunnel. Um, they seem to be hiding at the moment, they're probably hibernating somewhere at the bottom of the pond or under a stone. But they go around, eat the flies and slugs and, and snails in the polytunnel as there's a lot in this confined area. Because it's so warm, the pests can do, do quite well in here. Luckily aphids aren't a problem, but certainly slugs, so this is part of the remedy to help with the slugs and also the snails. So there is also a heating system in this polytunnel, and it's a thermal mass store that I, I put in probably about three or four years ago. So it starts off, what it, what it basically is, is there's a large fan up here and this sucks in a lot of warm air from the top of the point on where it's very hot. Takes it down underground and then loops around. It actually goes underneath the path, we put the path on top of it so that you don't dig up, dig up by accident. Comes back, goes underneath here and there's a giant old um, oil tank under there. I had to bury it under the ground and the oil tank is full of water. The tubes wrap around here twice and then blow over the water to transfer the heat. So it heats up the water and then it comes out of this vent here. The air comes out a lot cooler and so most of the heat is taken out of the air and stored into the ground. And then what happens is at night time when it gets quite cold, all that heat is then released out by constantly pumping air through. You get warm air coming out and also you get air, you get warmth leaching out of the soil once the soil is warmed up and it keeps it above freezing. So as you saw earlier it's quite frosty outside but in here it is below freezing. You can see the soil here is actually still loose, it's not frozen. So it does work quite well and I'll show you a quick clip now and I'll give you some links as well in the, um, in the icon up on the top right of other videos I've done showing how well it works in the winter with the frost and I'll give you, there's other videos there you can watch which are a lot more in depth of how the heating system works in the polytunnel. Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. I'm here up in uh, North Scotland again visiting my parents and as you can see it's been a very hard frost last night. According to the Met Office it was, it was down to minus eight so a good hard frost. You can see here on the planks of wood it's probably about a centimetre thick so there's a huge amount of frost. I'll also show you the soil over here which is completely solid. 
um, you can see there it's like a rock. Go inside now and let you see. So as you stand inside there is a slight noticeable difference in temperature but I wouldn't say it's a lot. And it did go slightly below freezing in here but, the, but with minus 8 outside I'm actually quite happy with a slight frost because that's a, probably about 7 degree difference it's had in here which is pretty impressive I think. So as you can see there's no signs of frost. It's not white or anything like that. There is a little bit of ice here and there, but, but really not much. You can see, it's nice and soft. You can see a few ice crystals in the top of it, but generally, you, know, you can move it with your hands. It's quite, quite soft. That's the dry soil, but even the wet soil here is very loose. And there's only a very minor frost on the very surface of it. So it probably only got down to minus one at the, at the lowest. So here is the greenhouse. It's kind of does a similar job to the polytunnel, but the climate's slightly different in here, so it, it benefits different plants. Again, they tend to grow tomatoes in here, and uh, there's a few old dead plants you can see in there, so you can get an idea of how large they were. You can see that they do, the tomatoes normally grow about two or three meters from my parents up here, and you can see there's actually a few green tomatoes left. So the difference with this in the polytunnel really is it's a lot drier in here. You can probably see that by the state of the soil. Um, also the temperatures tend to get higher in here and lower at night so this is better for crops that like it hotter but um, that, that don't mind it as, as dry so they have um, they often have corsets in here um, pe bell peppers do quite well also and anything that likes it slightly drier and not too wet so the, they would put their um, sweet corn in here because sweet corn is too humid in the polytunnel unfortunately but the headroom in here isn't enough because the headroom is all in the middle and that is unfortunately where you need to walk because if you had your paths at the edge then you'd be constantly ducking and hitting your head and we've done a few things here to moderate the temperature a little bit but as i say the temperature swings are much higher in here than they are in the polytunnel because it doesn't have an active system to, to cool it in in the daytime and heat it up at the night what it does have is a passive system and that is basically uh, water so there's two big drums here black drums full of water we also have all these plastic containers at the back full of water and they moderate the temperature somewhat there's also a few bottles lying around the, the, these can be moved around sensitive plants so if there's any plants that really don't like the cold what we can do is put these around them and that will kind of just keep the frost off if it does become particularly cold one night uh, but generally the frosts here, uh, they normally stop around May or June, so we don't need to worry too much after that. And we've also just covered up the back here. This, this, they could have been glass, but there's no point because there's just, a, there's just a wall behind there. There's not going to be any light coming off that side. So we've just insulated it slightly to provide a bit more warmth. And if we did have more of these plastic boxes, what we could do is have to make an entire wall of uh of water to make it a bit more insulate to, to absorb a bit more of the thermal mass but at the moment it seems to work okay as i say if anything is particularly sensitive to the cold we can put it in the polytunnel and that's normally plenty warm enough we don't have to worry so this is as i say stuff that's a bit more mediterranean climate we've also got lemon verbena here which does tend to take over this entire section in the summertime it's died back at the moment because it's winter and it's been clipped quite hard to harvest all the nice smelling leaves and we've also got my cycad here, which one day I'll probably bring back to my, my flat. But at the moment, I've not got a space for a cycad. But um, this one's quite old. I've actually had this cycad since I was a kid. So it's probably probably around about 15 years old, I think, this cycad. It's been struggling here in Scotland, but it can handle a light frost. So it lives outside. It's just a damp cold it can't really take and really hard frost. So this greenhouse gives it just enough protection. And the main issue it gets is it doesn't get warm enough in the summer. It really needs temperatures over 20 for it to thrive, and you just don't get temperatures over 20 very often in North Scotland. So here in the polit here in the um, in the greenhouse, it does get nice and hot, and it is doing okay. But um, it could ideally have a bit more heat and a bit more protection in winter. So next, I'm going to show you about vegetable storage and how the food can be stored, because obviously in the summer months, they produce masses and masses of food, and in the summer, in the winter months, you can't grow anything. So storage of food is just as important as being able to grow plenty of it.
So another important aspect of being self-sufficient in vegetables is actually the storage of the food because over in winter there's very little food being produced if any and so you need to be able to store the stuff you make in summer and also in summer if you have a bumper crop and you can't eat everything you need to be able to store it so it's not wasted and doesn't go rotten so this is what my parents used this is actually uh, a stone shed as you can see well it's a small stone building but we just call it the stone shed it's got very very thick walls so it holds temperature really well the only window is this one here and the doorway and the other side is just a solid stone wall but the walls here are about you can see about a foot thick but these aren't the thickest walls inside it's actually a lot thicker on the back it's difficult to sew the back wall but it's about two or three foot thick and it's slightly underground so the soil level at this side is probably about the height of the top of, of this part of the spade here where you put your feet but at the back is probably almost two foot underground so it's quite well stabilized the temperature in here it never really goes below freezing in winter because it holds the heat and, and with the thermal mass and then in summer it stays really quite cool because the stones hold the cold from the winter and also at night time when it cools down they hold the cold so it stays nice stable temperature also stays quite humid and damp that's why there's a bit of mold and algae on the walls because it stays really damp but a cool and damp is perfect for storing food um, or storing vegetables at least you wouldn't want to store anything that's dry uh, we don't store anything that's dried here it's only the the fresh vegetables that are stored here so there's lots of shelving that can be used for food it has to be a decent amount of airflow we've got some apples left most of the apples are now finished um, because it is the end of january it's getting a bit long so most of them been eaten here we have an enormous chest freezer the freezers are probably the most useful part of the storage system I mean, once food is frozen, it really doesn't really go off a day, out of date until it's defrosted. So we can keep stuff for years in the freezer. This is the chest freezer, so it's it's really, really large. You know, we can if you completely fill this up with frozen vegetables, that can probably do most of the winter. But we also have an, we also have another freezer, and we have two fridges as well for storing for storing food. The fridges only last, store things for a few weeks, but uh, the freezer for years. And then this this can store things for several months for most of the winter pretty much behind here we do have a lot of potatoes um there's some light that gets in from the window in that door so we do have cover up here otherwise potatoes would turn green and then they become poisonous um hopefully you can see some of the potatoes in there there's not a lot at the moment because most of them are still in the soil and you can see there's a sack there of potatoes it was a little bit warm in the earlier part of the winter and that's why some of them are sprouting in that sack and um but so it's just a small selection of potatoes at the moment the rest of the potatoes are actually stored underground we keep them underground for as long as possible as long as there's not really hard frost they they keep better underground because they kept really damp constant temperature so they're happier there here you've got to keep allowing them a bit more if any of them start going rotten or moldy you've got to take them out straight away otherwise it spreads to the rest of them whereas if they're underground they go rotten there's normally enough soil in between each potato that it doesn't then spread to the next one so this will actually become pretty full of potatoes in probably the next couple of months my parents what they tend to do is they harvest the potatoes as and when they need them in the winter out of the out of the ground they have a few stored here just in case it's weather like it is today where it's quite hard frost and the first inch of soil is frozen so you can't really dig out the soil when it's frozen so they get these ones for the cold spells and then come february they dig over all the plots get it ready for planting dig up all the potatoes they fill in, fill up these shelves here if there's not enough space there they can also fill up the shelving and the other shelves and that keeps them cool and then they'll normally last until about may time when the first early or of the first earliest potatoes start to come the first early varieties and um and then june as well and then they'll also come so that's just about it for the the food stories in this in this section anyway so this is the other fridge freezer used for food storage um, it's lots more than the other freezer but it's still a decent sized freezer and the fridge section is particularly large so we can store a lot of vegetables in there as well and the next section that i'll show you is going to be the other type of way that we store food and that's using preserves and jars uh, making jams and chutneys and that's more like the traditional way of storing food things in a jar will last probably a couple of years um, so not quite as long as they would last in a freezer but you don't need to have freezer space for them you can store them pretty much anywhere and with freezer space you're also running electric so there's a slight cost in, in storing food in, in freezers but it's minimal especially as we manage to power most things from the solar so this here is the other way that the food is stored and this is basically stored in the more old-fashioned way instead of putting it in the freezer 
it's done as preserves and so you can see there's lots of jams, chutneys. There's also a few pickles I think earlier in the year, but I think most of the pickles have been used. So I think these are all from this year. Um, just using old jam jars. This is quite a good way to store food as I said before. This can last many months, probably a couple of years that this will last for. But it uh, doesn't use any energy when it's being stored because you can keep it in any temperature. You don't need a fridge or a freezer like with a freezer. And um, but it does take a lot more preparation. So you know you've got to do quite a lot of cooking. You've also often got to add quite a lot of sugar to help preserve the the food stocks. Because if it's just on its own, if it's not, if it doesn't have something really sugary to take out, take away the moisture, or if it's not acidic, uh, it will go off. So that's why these have had a lot of sugar, or they've had vinegar added to them to make them last longer. So that's basically all the preserves. Um, depends on the year how many they get done. Um, some years, you know. If there's a lot of food they can get more done than this or if they've got a lot more time to so say with the preserves there's a lot more work involved so it's only if you've got spare time that they can really make lots of preserves but that's the other way that the food is stored from the garden and it's mainly fruit but um, it's also useful for things like green tomatoes which aren't really edible on their own but you can make them into nice chutneys and then this part of the wood store is actually used for onions now we, I think we've run out of onions now and what, what we do is, if, hopefully it's not too dark to see, is there's various nails on this beam here and they plait the onions and hang them. I'll see if I can find some photos for you and put that in, in now so you can see what they look like. But they hang the onions here and then the, this is a nice airy location. It's not too hot as well because there's good airflow and the onions keep really well in the cool airy places and, and they don't get too moldy. If we put the onions in the in the vegetable shed they tend to go moldy quite easily so that's why they're kept in here. Thanks for watching my video all the way through to the end. As you can see it did turn out to be a very long video and the aspect just about the food took a lot longer than I was expecting so instead of having the two parts of the video in one video what I've done is I've split them into two videos so this one was all about the food production how the vegetables were stored over the year and how my parents are able to keep themselves self-sufficient in vegetables over the whole season. So the next video will be much more about the Tesla Powerwall which is the picture that you're looking at right now. That's going to be talking about how the house is powered. Uh, basically it's mainly through solar panels but I'm also going to be looking at the heating system which is a log burning stove, uh, how the logs are stored. I'm also going to be talking about the solar voltaic system and also the solar thermal system which also heats the water as well as the solar Voltaic, which can do either the power in the house or it can do the hot water as well. So that video should now be up in the iCard on the top right hand corner. If it's not there, it will be there in the next few days and also there should be a link in the description down below that again if it's not there now, it should be in a few days time.